Welcome to another episode of the Sports Mecca podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Abramo. As always, I'm joined by my partner, Sam Hengeli. Today, we have the opportunity to speak with David Rabibo. David is the Harvard Westlake School boys basketball coach in California. David, Sam, and I appreciate the time this evening. Hey, happy to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Of course. I was so happy that you were able to agree to come on. So to start, you know, you had a very, very successful season this year with Harvard Westlake. You and your team completed the uh, 2022-23 season with an amazing record. You guys finished 33-2, and beating St. Joseph High School in the CIF State Championship. You know, talk about, you know, what you and the team have been doing since that moment last month? For me, um, I I got about a week and a half to kind of take it all in and decompress. And then uh, club started, and then you have to start planning spring workouts and things like that. Um, it, it's been a whirlwind. Uh, you know, we were on like Channel 11 News, Fox News. We were on CBS with Jim Hill. It's been a bit of a whirlwind. I think even for our guys, like uh, – you know, they've been doing things and, and getting interviewed and things like that, which has been really cool. But uh, I would probably say as of probably a week and a half ago, I would say majority of our guys have been in the weight room or in the gym working out, starting to get ready and uh, displaying a hunger for more, which is pretty impressive. Now, usually when the season ends, I mean, fortunately for you guys, you went all the way to the, you know, the the the, the very end as long as you could. But since you've been at the program for harvard west like have you had a very similar schedule like as soon as the season ends you get into that spring workout has it been a very similar for the past couple years so you know historically and and this is more just kind of culture driven you know our guys the the setup at harvard west like is really unique we've got incredible strength and conditioning staff that is full-time and available all the time to our guys uh, and then we've got a sports uh, sports medicine group that does an incredible job of just kind of maintaining, keeping them healthy, working with the strength and conditioning staff. So I would say from like my second year on, they've kind of just done it on their own where it's like, hey, uh, maybe I take a week off pending, you know, who I am. If I'm a heavy minutes guy, I might do some rehab and rehabilitate and let my body recoup for a week, a week or two. Um, if I'm a guy who wants or my role is going to be different next year and I want to get more minutes, maybe I'm in the weight room right away and I'm trying to get with an assistant coach within a week, um, and just start doing some individual workouts to start, you know, um, but we've also had guys, you know, one of our main players, uh, is Robert Hinton and even Trent Perry, um, the, the games, the season ended and those guys were like, Hey, let's start, let's go. I want to go to work, uh, which has been really cool to see and really fun to see. So. Uh, just just pretty special, man, all, all the way around. And culturally speaking, a uh, testament to, to our guys and their buy-in. Absolutely. Now, I'm curious, as, as the head coach of the program, what month or time period would you say is like the most dead in the off season, Or is there no such thing as a dead period? Well, you know, for us, um, July and August are, are – are fairly dead from the sense of Harvard Westlake. Now, typically in July, we encourage our guys to try to get in anytime between Monday and Thursday, pending their travel with club, and at least get a couple of lifts in and get rehab in. If they want to shoot with a coach, they can obviously coordinate those things. But, you know, hey, if you're a guy who just played five games and you need two days off, take two days off. We, we just are very cognizant of, of them and their bodies, you know, my my approach to the off season is the springtime is your time to be a selfish person. Like go be selfish, go work on your game, go, go shoot for a better role, go shoot for gaining weight and getting stronger and doing all those things so that you give yourself the best opportunity. But we also do that because we know come, come July, come June and July, they're going to lose a lot of weight playing basketball. So we try to really, hit the weight room hard, put them, you know, get them eating as much as they can, try to get them to gain as much weight, um, which is really important. And then, you know, typically in August, you know, the two, three weeks before school starts, we really back off and 
but like I said, you know, we've got full-time strength and conditioning staff and, 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 uh, sports medicine. So our guys are, will be in there even in August, you know, if they're healthy, they just, you know, we've got a hungry group of driven guys who not only do they want to win and be great, but they want to play in college and beyond. So it's, it's pretty cool. So a little bit of a, a recap of the recent season, considering you guys went 33 and two, you were able to win the CIF state championship. Give me some of your top moments from this season. It, it always starts early on when, you know, we, we traveled and uh, Brady Dunlap, who was our leading score, leading returning scorer and, and a r- big time focal point of our team. He hurt his foot in our first game. And, and, uh, I was like, okay, well, this is, you know, we had a, a series of games coming up and a couple of them were pretty good games and you had some pretty good groups. And then we were traveling to, traveling to Dallas for the uh, Hoop Fest at Duncanville. Um, and so to see our guys respond and, I mean, we we came out kind of guns blazing and won double figures in every game we played at that point and had guys stepping up. I, I thought that was probably my first moment. My second moment for us is when we won league undefeated. Um, our league is incredible with the likes of Notre Dame that had three high major guards and a bunch of really good players on that team. And then uh, Sierra Canyon, obviously, in the league. And then a bunch of really well-coached teams from from St. Francis, Crespi, Alamany, uh, Loyola, et cetera, et cetera, Chaminade. So it's just a really well-coached, really well, well-ran well league. Um, so to go undefeated in that was probably number two. And then, obviously, um, the highlight was, uh, you know, when making our state run, going to St. John Bosco and winning on the road, going to Centennial and winning on the road. And then, you know, essentially going up North and winning on the road again, pretty special. You just touched on how a top moment was winning the league, you know, speak about the, the landscape of California prep basketball and also you know, what that CIF state championship really means to the state of California, especially for those who may listen to this podcast that are not from the West Coast. You know, first of all, winning winning our league, like I said, it's it's probably the best league in California. It might be one of the best leagues in the country. I mean, I'm just top to bottom every single night. You're, you're getting incredibly well scouted. You're dealing with good players, teams with size, length, athleticism, uh, and then, you know, you've got the the Notre Dames and Sierra Canyons who, you know, get are getting players from all over the country and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, to do that and for us to do that and not have a transfer this year and, and only one transfer in eight years and do it with guys that we got in as ninth graders and develop is really special. You know, the landscape of Southern California is it's highly competitive. Um, obviously, you've got the uh, pop-up prep schools. You've got uh, the, the, the powerhouses, uh, the modern days, the Sierra Canyons, et cetera, the Corona Centennials, uh, the Harvard Westlakes, and that, you know, in that, in, or in that boat, in my opinion. Um, and then, you know, you've got a bunch of really good teams um, and schools that want to win in basketball because, hey, let's face it, uh, you know, football, you need 50, 60 guys to win, and they better be the right guys. Basketball, you get five or six, and you got a chance, you know. You know, it's it's ultra competitive. Uh, the talent level is incredible, and the coaching is really good and really, really uh, special. Now, you were hired on as the Harvard Westlake coach back in 2015. You replaced former coach Greg Hillard, who piled up more than 600 wins for the program, 13 league titles, and two state crowns. Talk about that transition of what it felt like, you know, replacing such a great coach in him. And did you learn any lessons from him that you were able to carry over from your your time now at the program? Obviously, anytime you replace a legend, you know, it's not easy, right? There, there are expectations you got to live up to and, and, and follow a standard that's set. But that also puts a level of, of pressure on you. And I think me personally, and, and we kind of pride ourselves in this as a program, like pressure is a privilege, you know, take, take advantage of it and embrace it and attack it. And, you know, from the moment I was hired, that's what we did. We wanted to uh, build a real program, a great culture, create, create accountable young men who are going to work hard and do what's asked of them. 
and uh, bring it on a daily basis, you know, and uh, we've done that. You know, we've got two state titles, a Division One title, five straight Mission League titles, um, and we're not done. And, I, and I'm incredibly excited for our future. So following his lead and, and hopefully living up to those uh, those expectations is, is something hopefully he's listening and looking and smiling, seeing what the program's doing. Absolutely. In an article recently, after you were able to win the championship back in March, the Harvard Westlake AD, Matt LaCour, um, you know, said this about you in the article, quote, you know, work ethic, morals, integrity. David won't sell out just to win, yet he continues to win at the highest level. These are all things that David is equipping our student athletes with as they enter the world, end quote. You know, what do those words mean to you, what he said to you? And you know, what does that say about maybe your ability to, to coach these high schoolers and build them to success, obviously on the court, but, you know, when they're high school career is over? Well, you know, listen, for me, the, the barometer is that for that to be recognizable, um, that that's what coaching is. Like anybody who's doing it just for wins and, and money and glory is never going to never going to gain what they should. And, and frankly, you're doing a major disservice to some kids that need more than that. So uh, to me, that's the job. And, and to hear that reiterated by our athletic director uh, to the media means the world to me because um, it means I'm doing my job. The, the flip side of that, um, you know, Harvard Westlake's a special place. It's beyond athletics. You know, it, it's one of the best schools, if not the best school in the country, with incredible teachers and incredible resources, incredible administrators uh, who do such a phenomenal job that the idea that, you know, you 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 aren't taking full advantage and, and, and embracing everything that this place has to offer makes no sense. And if I don't get our guys to understand that component, how can I get them to understand anything on the court? Uh, so for us, if you're considering Harvard Westlake and you want to come to our school, that's at the forefront. Um, if you're just coming for basketball, it's not going to work. It's got to be more than that. And uh, that's kind of been our model. And, and, and I think our parents and kids that have found the most success understand that. And when they embrace that, I think they find a tremendous amount of success and are able to thrive. So, um, so you've coached at the high school level and at the college level. What are some of the challenges that you experienced for uh, both uh, high school and college? Well, you know, at college, in the college level, camaraderie, building chemistry, kind of keeping your, your team stability-wise together. Um, the landscape has changed so much. Even in my uh, back eight years ago when I was an assistant at USF, um, you know, we were getting transfers. They just had to sit out at the time. And there was, you know, no real portal. Like, uh, maybe there was, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it wasn't like it is now. And, uh, you know, to to see it evolve to what it's been, it's, it's kind of sad for the game because, you know, here you go and you got these great coaches at these low levels, uh, lower levels, recruiting these players and developing developing them. And then they develop and well, guess what? I'm out, you know, or you're a, you're a high major player and you don't have a, you don't have the year you think you should have had and you're out. Um, which to me is, it, it's a sign that the game needs to be changed and that it's, it's, it's somewhat broken. I'm not saying every situation is good and I'm not saying you should stay in every situation, but what I am saying is that there's a, a, a point in which, People need to figure it out and not just run and move on to the next thing. Um, and and I think uh, as a, in general, as a, as a sport, that's something that needs to improve. And um, that was a struggle um, for the high school level. Although we may win and we have talent, uh, we don't just get in whoever we want. There's a tough application process you got to go through. Not everybody's admissible. Uh, more get turned away than get accepted. Uh, so I don't have the ability to just take who I want, so to speak, um, which in college you somewhat do have the ability to do that. Um, so that's been one of them. And then obviously time, you know, in high school, you just don't have as much time while you're less restricted. Um, they're kids, you know, they, they have other things that they need to do. They have parents, they have, 
you know, they're at the mercy of parents. We're in college. It's, you know, you can have a three hour window and you could use all three hours, you know, and, and kind of get that time in. And then mm -hmm. guess what? They can come in later and work out. They can come in later and lift and they can come in later and do all the things where in high school, you're a little more strapped for time and uh, you've got to manage time and, and, and create some level of balance so that the uh, the players have have some some stability and and are able to function. What made you choose the uh, high school level? You know, I, I grew up in Southern California. And so when I went to San Francisco, which is in Northern California, um, I, I loved it. I, I thought it was great. But I always knew about Harvard Westlake. And I always saw, uh, obviously, the tremendous amount of success. But I always thought to myself, man, that could be a monster in, in SoCal. Like, that could be an incredible program. Um, with the resources and the people there. And, um, and, and I just, when the job opened and I was contacted about it, I, I, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to listen more. And the more I got into it, I found myself really at a mini college. You know, it, 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 it has that feel. It has that kind of resources. Uh, obviously, it's not a college, but it had that feel. And that was very attractive to me. And then, you know, the idea to come home and, and be able to, uh, to, to be back in SoCal, I, I, I just jumped at the opportunity and I've loved it. So uh, being at a prep school, um, how do you, how do you build a uh, roster and then what's the school system like? So we, we are an independent private school. We're actually not a prep school, um, like in the sense of a normal, a regular prep uh, that you're probably thinking of. Uh, we're an independent private school that goes seven through 12. Um, so we've got two campuses that has our first campus in Beverly Hills and it's got a uh, grade seven, eight, nine. And then our second campus is in studio city and it has 10, 11 grades, 10, 11, 12. Everybody goes to school every day. Everybody has to do their homework. Everybody has to do all the things. Uh, mm -hmm. nobody's getting in, um, based on merit. Um, it is, it is a real school. Um, it is, you know, an expensive school. Everybody uh, has to apply for financial aid and their need is based on, I mean, their aid is based on their need, uh, nothing, nothing more, nothing less. So in every sense, we, we are a regular private school, which are a lot more prominent, obviously, in Southern California, I think, and probably the West Coast, maybe, the, and, and I guess in the East Coast a little bit, uh, but we are definitely not a, a prep school in the sense of that. So I'm... Um... How do you build your roster up? Do, do you have like tryout system and like, do you guys like try to like try to do like recruiting and how does that work? You know, the, the program I think kind of sells itself in that sense. Um, we have, we have kids and families who apply. They, they have, we have like certain days that where they're allowed to come and visit and they come to games and things like that. And I think that naturally draws interest. You know, we, we try to have a sense of who, who's who and, and, and all that stuff, but it's really hard. We have a, a, a youth club program, so that kind of helps us be out a little bit, kind of see who, who's, who's where and what's not, what not. Um, but it's it's an imperfect system, you know. You, we've gotten some young kids. We've we've seen some kids in the past that that hey, they've come to our summer camps and things like that. Hey, we think that kid's got a chance to be pretty good. Hey, you know that kid's dad's six nine, his mom's six foot. Like he might be big. You know, he's probably gonna be big. Mm -hmm. We should we should probably. See, you know, where that kid wants to go, if he's going to come as a seventh grader, things like that, you know. Um, so we, we've kind of gone that we've had that that kind of approach. And in most cases, you know, the school kind of sells itself and, and naturally draws people. So, you know, you've got a great school and then you get a great program. It kind of handles itself, so to speak. One player you got to uh, coach was uh, Johnny Jusang, who had some great moments in the uh, 2021 NCAA tournament for the UCLA Bruins. And now is playing in the NBA. Um, Coaching him, uh, what what has uh, made him the player that he is today? And uh, did you see this uh, potential that he would get to to the level he's at right now? Oh yeah, he he was special special worker, uh, like nothing I've ever seen. So as a freshman, he 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 was probably about forty six percent from the field, and maybe like forty two from three. And we're like, man, this guy's just scratching the surface. And uh, heading into his sophomore year. I remember one morning I got to school early, like about 6 a.m., and Johnny was on the track by himself. And then he'd uh, go upstairs and he'd go shoot. 
Then he'd come downstairs and he'd go in the training room and get his body treated. And then later on in the afternoon, he'd go lift. And then we'd have team practice. And so he would do all those things. And at that point, I'm like, this guy's special. Um, he, he was fearless. He had a, a burning desire to get better. And uh, I knew it was only a matter of time. Yeah, awesome. What, what was it like uh, watching him make that uh, final four run in uh, 21? Well, you know, it was it was brutal because we were kind of, you know, we were shut down for the most part. And, uh, you know, you, all you had was that. So, like, every game, every, you know, you're on pins and needles, um, just hoping your guy's doing it. And the other part is, you know, he was doing it really, really hurt. He was uh, – he was, had stress, stress reactions in his ankle and was in a boot after every game. Um, and to see him doing that – while injured was was pretty phenomenal um uh he, he, just a special special talent just a testament to his uh, mental toughness totally yeah tough kid listen he he he's a great kid who worked hard who listened who bought in and reaped the benefits of his hard work and 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 you know he he, he was he was special we still talk to this day i mean the minute the minute we won the next day, he texted me, congrats, coach. So proud of the team and the program. And then he said, I'll be back in the summer and I need new Harvard Westlake gear. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. So uh, Harvard Westlake is a top 10 uh, program, according to uh, Max Preps High School basketball rankings. What are some of your core values that have helped this program to get to where they are right now? You know, it, it's really simple for us. Do the right thing. You know, if you're not, if you wouldn't do it in front of your parents, don't do it here. Treat everybody with respect and work. And as long as you're doing those things, we feel like the rest will take care of itself. That's what we kind of pride ourselves on. It's what we want to live and die by. And uh, it's where we're at. So, uh, so now you're in the off season right now. Um, so what does like the summer conditioning look like at Harvard Westlake uh, throughout the summer besides guys playing club and going to get shots up yeah so we'll we'll start uh we're on spring break this week next week we'll start our guys will be in the weight room three to four times a week uh we'll probably throw in a workout next week and it'll be a lot of skill development a lot of fundamentals a lot of basic stuff uh and we'll progress and as we hit may we'll ramp that up to about three days a week where we start kind of building our identity and, and kind of formulating like who we are this year you know i'm not a believer that you do things one way. Uh, you have to adapt and be adaptable to your personnel. And so we'll start to build that. And then we'll approach June. And for the month of June, we'll we'll practice about five to six days a week. Um, there are two live periods in June, January 16th through the 18th and January 23rd to the 25th. And we'll play in both of those live events. And then that'll end. Uh, our guys will lift the following week, do some skill work shooting, and then they're going to go to their clubs and, Basically, Monday through Wednesday, our, our school and our gym is available in our weight room. And then, you know, as the, the viewing periods come, do your thing. And if you need you need to rest, rest. If you need rehab, get your rehab. And uh, that's kind of our process until the school year starts. So what's one thing about the coaching profession that you knew to be true when you first uh, got started? You know, um, I actually say this every year in our parent meeting. Coaching is the only profession where your office is open to the public. And within a 32 minute game, everybody has the ability to critique question and uh, disavow any work you've done over the three, four days you've had prepping, regardless of the five games that I've watched in the 10 to 12 hours, your, your 32 minute view uh, will, will completely skew your opinion of our team, me, and, uh, you know, I, I, I address that. You know, I think it's important that people know that, that this is not an easy job, that, yes, it is open to the public, but just know we work and, and we're trying to do everything we can to help your kids, your son, your, these players not only win but achieve their goals. And uh, so I, I, I just kind of think that's something that uh, while you know it, uh, it's pretty amazing given that. Not very many can, people can go to your office and just criticize you, right? Or right. <laughs> well, they come to my office and they get to criticize me all they want. <laughs> and, 
Yeah. What's one thing about the coaching profession that you thought was true, but it turned out to be the opposite? I I think, you know, I, I always thought that you had to be a certain way all the time. And uh, the reality is, is that you have to be what your team needs you to be. Yes, like I may be a quiet person, but if my team's quiet, well, I got, guess what? I got to be loud then. You know, I got to have the energy. Hey, if, if I've got a loud team, well, then I may have to be the calming influence. Um, so I think, you know, despite who you think you are uh, and what you think, you may need to be something else for your team. And I think uh, being being adaptable as a coach, you know, if you're a yeller, well, if your team doesn't respond well with that, you, you need to adapt. Y- yeah, you may still yell, but you better adapt if you want to maximize what you have. Um, the days of, of my way or the highway, those days are gone. So who are some uh, current or uh, former uh, college or MBA coaches that you looked up to and uh, took like some things from their philosophy and tried to make it your own? Well, you know, you, you, you can't talk coaching without talking Coach Wood and, you know, obviously all of his philosophies and just interpersonal workings um, are, are things that you try and learn from still to this day. Um, guys that I've really appreciated and grown incredibly fond of, Tony Bennett, you know, just a culture guy, a guy who, you know, one of the things he said to me, and, and I carry this all the time, get guys you can lose with, you know, then you then you know you're doing things right. And uh, I think that's such a profound thing and, and uh, something that I truly, truly believe in. And, and, you know, systematically just the belief in who, what they are, who they are, things like that. Uh, coach Cronin at UCLA, obviously, a really good coach. Um, gets his guys to play incredibly hard and, you know, buying a defense and things like that. Coach Enfield, obviously at UC, USC, does a really good job on the offensive end and, and a really good coach has built that program up. And, you know, they're recruiting nationally, um, you know, top players in the nation. Jeez. You know, then you've got the Coach Popoviches, the Phil Jackson, you know, the the, the list goes on and on. Like I – I find myself going back. Uh, I have so many games recorded on our TV, but I have synergy and I'm able to access and I'll go back and watch tournament games. Um, you know, if I think, hey, looking at our personnel for next year, we're going to have two bigs. OK, well, hey, who are teams that played with two bigs? Let's watch those. You know, Coach Painter at Purdue who does a really phenomenal job getting post touches and things like that. So that that's kind of how I'll um, mimic it. Hey, we're going to be fast and athletic. Maybe I need to watch Shaka Smart and Marquette and kind of see how they spread the floor and speed teams up and things like that. There are some incredibly innovative people. To me, great coaches see things and they find a way to make it their own and they find a way to teach it. And that's kind of what I've tried to do um, while listening to some of the greats and, and kind of taking some of, some of their philosophies and finding ways to make it applicable. That's awesome, um... So do you have any advice to those that are chasing their dreams? Keep keep working, man. There's no shortcuts. I was a 24-year-old, 23-year-old head coach at El Camino Real in 2008. And uh, I, I, was a, I was not a full-time teacher because there was a hiring freeze. I was coaching. I was giving lessons in between – at before and after practices, I was helping with youth clubs, youth leagues, just doing everything I could to survive because I wanted to coach. It's what I wanted to be. And I kept working. And then I got into club and I kept working. And then I got uh, an offer at the University of San Francisco and I was an assistant. And then I kept working. And then I got hired at Harvard Westlake. And, you know, now I think I'm at the best high school job in the country. And uh, I think it's pretty special. I think if you just, if you keep working, at the very least, you're going to know you gave it all you got, and uh, you can all live with that. Absolutely. When when you had the conversation with Sam just a minute ago about you know coaches that maybe look after, you mentioned you know feeding the post. You would watch Zach Eady, or if you want to try to make a improve your fast break and maybe have a little bit of an up tempo, you look at Shaka Smart as a high school coach. Is it, especially at your level, is it very important to build relationships with college coaches? Because 
you know, the college coaches are there to, to recruit your kids at the next level. No question. Um, the, the, the idea that, you know, you're not going to have a relationship with college coach. You have to have a relationship with college coach for a variety of reasons. Number one, you got to know who you're sending your kid to and, and got to know what they're about. There are some coaches that if they called me, they, that my, my, our players may not feel that way, but I, I might say, Hey, there's no way in hell, no way, no way I'm helping you. Cause I know how you treat your staff. I know how you treat your players. And so I think that's important for the first component of it. Cause you got to, you got you to you gotta help your players in the recruiting process because I don't want my players to transfer. Uh, number two, you know, if your player is interested and good enough and they want that school, you know, be, I got to help and I got to be able to call that school um, and build that relationship and get them out to see him, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last part is, you know, if the kid's there and he's struggling, like I got to be able to call and have a relate and have a conversation um, because I think it's, we're all there. You know, it takes a village, man. And, uh, Anybody who's not in it for the kid and not in it, you know, and, and by the way, being in it doesn't mean you hand the kid anything or it changes. Like maybe this is just the, his process. His process is sitting a year and earning it and, you know, getting better, whatever the case may be. Great. I'm all for it, but I just want to know, you know, so uh, building those relationships is so important. Plus it also helps me as a coach, you know, being able to call, uh, you know, TJ Benson, who's an assistant at Arizona, say hey can i can i get some practice film i want to watch you guys how you handle ball screens here in this situation or whatever the case may be uh and and any other coach um is, is so advantageous and so helpful for me to in my growth as as a coach for sure we hope to we hope uh that you'll send some of your guys to uh to you to lawrence kansas and hopefully they'll <laughs> be a jayhawk one day Coach Coach Townsend's been out a few times, man. We're 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 waiting for him to come again. Kansas has to get some guys out of the transfer portal right now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, it'd be cool if we got some California guys on the team. Um, Heck yeah! But for for you, um, do you have any social medias, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, that you're willing to promote, and also if uh, you're Harvard Westlake program has, you know, social media is that you're also willing to promote on that end. Yeah. You know, for Harvard Westlake, we're under HW hoops, um, which is Twitter and Instagram. And for me, I think my, my Twitter is like at D Rubibo, And then my Instagram is at David Rubibo. Nothing, uh, nothing too special on my end. Um, and uh, I'm, I wish I was better at it. Our school social media we actually have a social media guy who kind of handles it and does a great job. Um, I wish I was good at it, man, but I'm, I'm, I'm not great. <laughs> That's all right. Well, David, we appreciate you coming on. We've had a handful of high school coaches. Most of them have been you know, in the Kansas city area. So for you to come on and share about your experience out in California was really enlightening for Sam and I. And my, my pleasure. Happy to do it guys. Thank you, coach. All right, guys, take care, okay? For those who are listening to our show for the first time, all our past and future episodes are available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Sports Mecca.